Jamin, how are you? I'm all right. How are you guys doing? Good, good. Thanks for coming on, man. Oh, thanks for having me. We're big fans. Yeah, it's an honor big... to have you on our show. It really is. And, um, and since we're being honest, I'm sure you'd like to go ahead and say what an honor it is to be here. Um, I was just going to get to that. It was just that was right. literally the next thing I was going to say. There we go. <laughs> I actually was uh, listening to your Interstellar uh, podcast um, not too long ago, and I actually stopped because I haven't seen it yet, believe it or not. And oh, yeah. Well, we, we totally have spoilers, so you don't Yeah, like- I know, and I realized that, and I was like, I better stop listening to this. But I thought I found you guys very enjoyable. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> that you, you and uh, five other people. That's good. <laughs> good. Yeah, namely well, our well, parents. <laughs> Well, I'll, uh, I'll join them at, at Christmas, and we'll all, uh, we'll all support you. Uh, so let's, let's get right into it, man. What did you think of the Sony hack? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. We've been talking about that a lot lately. I, I have to say I'm really, really disappointed in the way that Sony has handled it. I mean, I, I understand they're in a really tough situation, but... Um, but I mean, I think it's really unfortunate. I, I I don't think that that's how they should respond. You know, we can't we can't be worried about those things. And um, but it is. I think it's really. I mean, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I think it's it's just a a ri- reminder of how vulnerable everybody is and and how vulnerable the industry is. And um, and I think you know we we're always trying to think about you know what's the next thing and and trying to be aware of kind of where technology is going and how people want their media. And, um, you know, I'm I'm someone who, who believes largely in just accessibility of movies. And, um, I think obviously to me the, the, the clear thing for Sony to do is just drop it online. Right. And, um, I don't know why they're not doing that, and I don't know, even know why that's even a, a debate. Because I, I wait, you're, you're saying you're saying drop the movie online? No, no, no. He put it online, like video on demand. It makes perfect sense because oh, okay. yeah. it's it's garnered such notoriety at this point that it would just explode in a, in a good way. In, yeah, you know, exactly. Money. And, and now's the time to do it. I and mean, they're getting unprecedented press right now. I and mean, they're getting so much attention. And I mean, I, I think that they could do really, really well on VOD if they just put it out. I mean, I, I I still think they should release it in theaters, but um, I think that ship has probably sailed, and so the best thing they could do is just put it on VOD, and I think they would get get really really good sales, and 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 they win in the end, you know. Well, here's here's thinking about it from a business standpoint. If they if they were to drop this on VOD, somebody could just could so easily just take a screen, you know, they could just screen record their their. Uh, their desktop while the movie's playing and then release it onto any one of these pirated sites mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which would i mean yeah. which, which which would severely uh dampen their their, their profitability uh, yeah yeah i mean i that's debatable too uh, you know i mean i, I think I, that's something that we we've, we've debated a lot i think you know we talk a lot about piracy because um you know our film inc uh was pirated back in 2009 2010 what and, an honor! Um, we saw it as a very good thing. I mean, in that we had this tiny little obscure film that we made with two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and it was getting out slowly. You know, we were developing a fan base, but we were doing it theater by theater, and it just wasn't. We didn't have any money to market the film, and then for whatever reason, somebody, um, you know, within a week of its DVD release, it. Um, I think actually within like twenty four hours or forty eight hours, it. Um, it was pirated and it, whoever pirated it somehow got it into like the top 100 on Pirate Bay and it ended up kind of blowing up on Pirate Bay. And then that gave us really, really great exposure, um, in, in areas of the world we wouldn't have otherwise gotten exposure. You know, I mean, I would say a huge majority of the piracy that we got were in, in places that, you know, uh, you, you know, we we couldn't reach because we didn't. Um, we were self distributing. We just didn't have any way to reach these play, places. So we very much saw it as a good thing. Now I think if you're a huge Hollywood film and you're spending fifty to two hundred million dollars, it's probably a little bit a different situation. I mean, you're really counting on on theater goers, and you're really counting on um, you know your VOD and all of that. But I mean, the film's going to get pirated no matter what. I mean, if they release it theatrically, the film's going to get pirated. So I mean, I don't think that there's any anybody who's trying to avoid that. I think it's a losing battle. Um, I think that they just have to find other ways to to monetize it in the long run. Hmm. So in those aspects, I'd say it seems that it almost perfectly parallels the music industry, basically mm-hmm. in the sense that you have smaller acts, lesser known musicians that welcome 
pirating and the file sharing, let's say, as a mm-hmm. euphemism, that, that they basically welcome it because it increases their exposure. Whereas mm-hmm. some of the larger acts might feel that it infringes on their profits on the bottom line. You feel that your movie being pirated actually helped spread it your did. name. It did. You know, it's, it's a really interesting thing because with the music industry, they have a slightly different model because it works, I'd say in some ways it works better for the music industry. And, and I'm sure a lot of musicians would probably disagree with me on this. Um, the thing is with music, you have an act, right? You have an act that you can tour with, you can take it um, – you know, city to city, and you can monetize your product that way. So if you are, um, you know, Lord, for instance, Lord, you know, kind of blew up on um, Pandora and, and Shopify and, and or not Shopify, um, Spotify, uh, Spotify um, and kind of online, um, you know, people like Skrillex, all these guys, um, Pretty Lights, they all kind of um, came out online. And like Pretty Lights, for instance, they offer their stuff for free. Um, but he does these huge shows and he, and that's where he generates his money. So I think the attitude in the music industry is give the music away or for a lot of musicians is basically give the music away, um, to build your fan base and then make your money on your tours and your merchandise. Um, but with films, it's different because your film is your film and that's all you have. You're not really, there's you can't not, do a live version of it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Unless you're going on tour, like doing Q and a, which we've done a little bit of, but that's, um, it's not really a good way to monetize it. So that's kind of the big struggle that I think um, indie filmmakers and, and filmmakers in general are really dealing with is trying to say like, okay, this is a reality. And not only is piracy a reality, but also um, the, I mean, Blu-ray and DVD are starting to disintegrate more and more. And um, yes, people are buying stuff on I- iTunes and Amazon. However, those revenues aren't as strong as you know, uh, buying physical merchandise, uh, you're maybe doing like a, an eight to $15 sale, whereas you used to be doing like a 20 to $30 sale. And so those revenues are being lost as well. And fewer people are going to the theater. So filmmakers are really struggling to figure out, okay, how do we monetize this now? How do we get people to pay something to see our movies? And, um, and that's the ultimate struggle. And, And I don't think anybody really has the answer. Do you envision a, a distribution model? a monetized distribution model in the future? And if so, what is it? You know, I, I think our attitude is, you know, we, fortunately we're not in the same cir- circumstances that the big boys are. I mean, we we're making independent films with small budgets and that's where we want to be because it gives us creative control. I think when you start making movies for a lot more than, you know, a couple million dollars, it gets really, really hairy as far as the future, the way the future looks. Um, I think either you have big event films, you know, like Marvel movies or Star Wars, or you have very, very small niche films that um, appeal to a very specific crowd. Um, so our attitude going forward has just been, you know, don't spend a lot of money so that we can have creative control, but that we can also make our money back. And we we are we're really hardcore about self distribution. We our very first film, Eleven Fifty Nine, when we released that movie. Um, we did it sort of traditionally through sales agents and distributors and, um, and essentially got completely screwed. I mean, much like music labels often screw their artists, it was a very similar situation. Um, we just didn't get paid any of the money that was made. Wow. And so, so as Inc. came out, we, we were really um, dead set on let's, let's self-distribute. You know, the Internet is a thing now. <laughs> let's take advantage of that. And... Um, and we just and, and the other thing that was happening was Facebook was really becoming a thing, and um, we just said, you know, we'd rather have a smaller audience, but a more intimate connection with our audience, and be able to distribute our stuff directly to them. And you know, when they pay for our movies, they are supporting us a hundred percent. And so that's kind of how we've gone about it. Now we still have to have aggregators. We still have to have um, sort of an in between between us and iTunes and Amazon. Um, but this, you know, it's a kind of a one-time fee thing. They're not taking lifelong, um, you know, revenues and, and things like that. So, you know, looking forward, you know, our whole strategy, I think, is just to say, you know, is to just is to brand ourselves and just to be. That's, that's such a corporate way to put it. Um, basically, to to have authenticity, you know, and I think that's the thing that we can offer that, um, you know, a lot of Hollywood films can't, which is that. When we make movies, they are 100% us. You know, they're our voice, and um, 
And when you buy stuff from us, you're buying from, you're essentially buying a piece of art from us. And that's, and so that's kind of, we, you know, we're trying to, um, you know, build our social networks, make sure that our fans know that we acknowledge them and respect them and, um, that we have a a direct connection with them. And, um, um, that when they, yeah, when they buy, when they buy our film or they, they watch our film, they're supporting us. That's a great point. And, um, something I think everyone can get behind. But w- what you were talking about earlier in terms of the financial uh, uh, contingencies or, or maybe even limitations, is that something that you feel, along with perhaps the uh, concurrent rise in uh, viable TV drama, like good quality TV programming, is that what we pretty much owe to the demise of the $20 million movie? You know, just that, that sort of mid-level? Because you did mention, you sort of hinted at how if you're going to do a movie these days with a studio, it's got to be a blockbuster. It's got to be 200 million or more, or it's better off to just be more independent and just do your own thing. Yeah. And, and I think what happened, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of changes. I mean, there's, there's so many things kind of going on. One is, is, you know, streaming video. Um, and that kind of took, took this huge pocket of money out of the system. Um, fewer people are, are going to the theater. And I think the big thing is Hollywood, eventually just kind of found this business model, you know, in the last several years. Um, and they just can continue to go further and further in this direction, which is that it makes more sense for them to spend a hundred million dollars on one movie. That's going to be a huge hit than it does to make, you know, 10 movies, um, you know, for, for less. And that used to be the model. I mean, there used to be movies that were made for, I mean, and all my favorite films kind of came out of, of sort of those, um, you know, from the 50s through, you know, the early 2000s. Most of the movies that we all love are, you know, we're in that sort of 10 to, to $30 million price range um, where there weren't these monster, you know, huge, huge movies that had to appeal to everybody. They, were, they had a little bit more of a, a niche quality to them but they still had a lot of production quality and and all that but that hollywood is no no longer really interested in making those movies there's a few people out there that are doing that but for the most part that middle range movie is completely gone and so now what you're seeing are filmmakers you know like me or um there's a few other people out there who are trying to make those types those types of movies on much much less money um so instead of like 20 million dollars we're trying to do you know for less than you know, 500,000. There's a few people doing it for far less than that. There was, you know, I don't know if you guys heard about the movie Coherence, but it was made for, I think, $15,000. And it was a great little sci-fi film, all kind of set around a house. And, um, you know, these char- these characters at a dinner party, and it's this great little sci-fi film made for no money. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more stuff like that, where, you know, we're going to see we're going to see people make up in, creati- in creativity what they don't have in money, hopefully. Oh, okay. Now, let, let me get back to what you, what you were saying about the mid-level movies here. Um, one, do you think there will be a renaissance of those movies because, because of these, these giant movies that really have very little substance to them? Do you, do you think that the population is going to crave more substance, or do you think they're getting that from high-quality TV dramas, like Dan said? Two, mm-hmm. is it possible the mid-level movies might be made overseas? Yeah, boy, that's a really good question and really good point. I, you know, there's anything I, I feel, you know, they, there's a lot of like, you know, indie filmmakers right now that are saying that the sky is falling and that there's never going to be a way to make money doing this and all of that, and there's no way to monetize it, and that that I, I don't. I don't really buy. I guess I feel like if there's anything we know that the technology is constantly changing and that new um, new things are always arriving. I mean, back you know when movies you know first were invented, no one ever dreamed that they had a shelf life beyond the you know the six months or year that they might play in a theater. But then, fifty years later, all these old movies you know, or actually seventy years later, all these old movies are now you know suddenly popping up on VHS and VHS is a thing. And then TV is a thing, of course. And so they're being syndicated on TV. And so there's all these, these new lives for, for these things. But back to your question about will that mid range movie come back? I, man, I really don't know. I, I, um, I, I, I've thought for probably over a decade now (laughs) that people are going to get sick of these really, really big movies 
Oh, and, um, <laughs> and, never and underestimate that. I like, I, oh, sorry, what was that? I was saying never underestimate the stupidity of the American public. Right, in many that's cases. right. I mean, I, I think, uh, to be fair, I mean, I think it's largely because that, that's just what they're advertised. That's what they hear about. That's all they think exists. So it's not necessarily that that's what they want. There's just nothing else. You know, th- there's no exposure for the other films out there. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, I think, and, and a lot of those great, you know, there are some really great, huge movies being made, um, but but not that many, I, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, whether that mid-range movie comes back, I really don't know. I, I don't know. I, I'm not, I guess I've been waiting for quite a while, and I don't think it's going to happen. I've only seen it get worse. Um, but to your point, I mean, I do think that other markets are opening up, and yeah, and maybe it will come out of someplace other than America. I guess... I do feel like America currently has, you know, it's by far the strongest, um, you know, filmmaking industry out there. I mean, there's there's other industries obviously making movies, you know, India and China are making their own movies, but none of them have the global appeal, obviously, that American films have. I don't know that that's always going to be the case. It's just it has been that way. I mean, America's had their their foothold in, in that industry since it began. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think? Well, I, I think some of these, like, okay, you, in your movies, you, you seem to play around with the idea of free will versus fatalism a, a mm-hmm. lot. And there was a great movie that Dan and I were going to talk about today. M- maybe we still will. We don't know. Uh, called Frequencies that played around with that idea. It was a British movie though. And it, mm. and the movie had a nice sheen to it and it looked like it was made for about 10 million to $20 million. Hmm. So I, I'm hoping that overseas, that there, there's still some culture left overseas, uh, that they do dump some money into these things and, and make uh, make movies that are on par with A Few Good Men or Heat or things like that. Yeah, Heat. That's a, that's a great one. That's one of my favorites, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, yeah, and I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know exactly what all Britain is doing. Um, they definitely have some good stuff coming out of there, but I don't know how their industry is structured. Um, and I, I just – I think that most industries probably will kind of follow the Hollywood model. I mean the Hollywood model is um, they do it because it's, it's proved to make them the most amount of money. Um, and at the end of the day, that's always what's going to win. It's not necessarily the – obviously the best films. It's just the money. Um, I, I guess I, I have more hope for I, – I do have hope internationally, but I have more hope for sort of the international independent scene. Um, whether it be in America or, or elsewhere, I think um, I do think that there's a lot of really, really strong independent filmmakers out there, um, and so I guess I could see that that growing. I do think that with I do think people are consuming more media now than they ever have. You know, they say that um, people who've had a Netflix account for a certain amount of time, their their taste in movies starts to become more sophisticated. Um, because they do get tired of the the blockbustery stuff. Well, that's all the how, time. that's how it happened for me. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, actually, it happened. Yeah, he for used me. to be a real idiot. Yeah, now. I used to be. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be a the, moron. Join the, the enlightened like the rest of us. Huh? You know, and and a lot of times, what Netflix does though, it, it sometimes the, the movie is good, but it has such horrible cover art on it mm-hmm. that you, that you don't that you don't want anything to do with it. So you have to take a chance. So I think uh, a lot of people, even with Netflix. Miss out on good movies just be, just because of the the way it's packaged when they when they see it. Yeah, and that's and that's something that we're all sort of contending with is that you know with our indie films made for you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars we have to somehow compete with Hollywood you know and and yeah like you said the cover art or you know I mean and just com- you're just competing with not having big stars in your movie so um, people are less likely to give it a chance because they just want to see familiar faces and um, you know you've got you know two people that they've never seen before and um, oh, they must not be good actors because I've never seen them before um, not true at all not true yeah, at all exactly but that's but that's I think the mentality so it takes so much I think and and I mean just in Hollywood I mean for every hundred million dollars that they're spending on the film they're spending another hundred million dollars on advertising um so i mean there's just there's just no way to compete with that but um i do think that the hope is that people are consuming more media and their their tastes are you know they they are going to start longing for other things and i think that that's where you know the independents come into play as they they have a more unique voice and they're going to do something that you haven't seen over and over again 
So then pertaining to your own career, I guess the question I have is if whether that sort of mid-level picture resurfaces or not, is this something, if it does, is that something you could see you'd like to work on in terms of future endeavors? Or do you really want to stay in more of the uh, low budget sense and sort of retain more creative control? Or I guess basically I'm asking you, would you ever, if the money's right, are you going to be the next uh, director of uh, a Star Wars movie reboot? Yeah. (laughs) Um, And if so, can Dan and I be in it? (laughs) Yeah, that's the real question. Of course. Well, I would do it just just for that. I I think that would be part of the contract. Um, Eight million dollar quote, just like Seth Rogen. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. Um, no, I mean, I, I definitely, I, I'm, I'm, I'm. The money thing isn't so much a factor as Final Cut. Um, unfortunately, I think I was just born in the the wrong era, and that I think <laughs> you have artistic I, integrity. Uh, yeah, I, no, I just I long, my it. dear man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I needed to be making movies when I, you know, in the in the sixties and seventies when directors actually had Final Cut. Um, but I, I think that that's really the only thing that matters to me. I mean, absolutely, we would love to have budgets, um, you know, bigger than what we're working with. But um, we're not really – like, I'm, I'm not looking to – I mean, as much as I love Star Wars, I'm not looking to, to do that, you know. And I'm not looking to um, make anything other than my own stuff. And, um, and so – and, and and just the way the industry works, there's just there's just no final cut out there for for filmmakers if you're going through the the typical system. And you know, it took us a while to kind of figure that out. I guess I was op- more optimistic, you know, maybe five or ten years ago, um, and really thought like, no, if, you know, if we just have a, a big enough success or something, then then that might open up. But I think we've, you know, I, I know a lot of different filmmakers and and have since been educated about that and just realized like, no, there's just no way. To do that now, if if that sort of twenty thirty million dollars scene kind of comes back, and somebody wants to give us final cut and twenty million dollars, then yeah, great, <laughs> we'll take it. Um, but uh, but you know, it's funny because at the same time, there is a lot of pressure when you have a lot of money. I mean, there's pressure even when you're you're dealing with a small budget like we are. Um, you know, we are taking investors' money, and you know, these are p- people, these are friends of ours, and we want to make sure we can make their money back. Um, and the more money you take, just the more pressure there is to perform and the harder you can fall. And so there is that side of it. But that said, yeah, I mean, it'd be great to, to you know, work with more money and to be actually be able to pay our crew properly and, you know, <laughs> feed everybody properly and, um, you know, have my wife. Get the space station up and running. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, very good. Get that space station, space station going. Well, you certainly have the, requi- the requisite talent. I mean, we've reviewed uh, two of your films previously, uh, quite favorably, I might add. Uh, oh, thank we both you, watched. Actually, in- interestingly enough, Brendan introduced me to The Frame. Oh, great. And uh, then we went back and watched Ink. And even most recently, I watched Spin. Oh, cool. Great. That's yeah. an old one. Yeah, I actually, I really loved Spin. And it's sort of how you incorporated that whole, you know, sensitive dependence on initial conditions, like from the James, Cle- James Gleick's uh, Chaos book. I don't know if you read it or not, but like just that whole, the butterfly flapping its wings in America causing the tidal wave over yeah, in Indonesia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I just loved how it was actually made into a nonverbal short. Um, what was your thought process in terms of going in and making that one? Um, you know, I had, in, in film school, we, we, um, I went to film school for a year and then I dropped out. But the one thing I really got out of film school was, uh, we had this exercise where we had to, um, tell a story, uh, using slides. So we basically did a slideshow and we just, we couldn't have any dialogue obviously. And so we had to basically using still images, tell a story and so after film school, I was really obsessed with making films with no dialogue and just trying to trying to tell a story only cinematically. And um, because it, to me, is the thing that really attracts me about film is that it's an opportunity. It's an art form that you can do things in that you can't in any other form. So if you you can write a book, but that's that's one thing. You can um, write a play and perform a play, but you know, with film, it's you're you're cutting images together to create an overall um, uh, impression, right? So you're cutting the an image of a person looking and an image of a glass of water, and you put those two together, and and you're saying this person is thirsty, right? And um, so I love the idea of montage, and I love um, all the other things that you can do with film. So I spent a lot of time just kind of playing with that. Um, for a few years, and then eventually um, made 
spin as just something that, you know, we literally it was made with, I think, $500. We had no money. And um, so we just, I, I had a friend who, who is the lead in the in spin. Um, oh, oh, and I guess for your listeners, I don't know if they know, it's, a, it's an eight minute short film. Um, it's available on YouTube. You can see it on YouTube. It's got over uh, 3 million views. It does, yeah. Um, and uh, so the, the DJ who's in the movie, um, I was just, he's a friend of mine. And so I, I went out to see a show. He's a real DJ. And uh, he was um, spinning records and, and singing and doing all this great stuff. And I was just like, man, this guy has the world at his, his fingertips. And I just thought, like, what a great what a great opportunity. Like, he should have the world at his fingertips. And so I, I kind of turned into this idea of uh, a guy who can con- control the world with um, – with his turntables. Very That's, cool. Now, let me ask you, did, did Spin get you that necessary attention and acclaim to go on to bigger things, being that it, it has over 3 million views and was so um, well-liked by the viewers? Because if, if that's the case, I would just like to point out that Brendan and I know a comedian who's garnered over a million views <laughs> for yelling you know, horribly racist remarks at an Asian couple and then getting punched in the face. So I guess, will, will he be the next big thing? Does he have a directing debut upcoming, maybe? <laughs> Boy, I don't know. We, we, we hope not. That sounds bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The whole thing no. was staged. Yeah, it's, it was an entire stage, like in, a, in, the, in the mold of a Sasha Baron Cohen type of situation. Oh, but it did. Cool, he actually cool. does have over a million views. But, but it, it is a legitimate question. In other words, like, this, yeah. w- was the YouTube attention what garnered you your next uh, job, so to speak? Yeah, you know, Spin is a really interesting story. Um, so when we, when we actually made Spin, we were making it to kind of just help promote promote ourselves. And we had, 11, we had just made 1159, which is our first feature. And we made Spin as a way to kind of get attention on our website and get people to come see it. Now, this is before Facebook and Twitter. And it was actually before YouTube by like six months. And wow. so when we launched it on our website, um, it went viral immediately and it crashed our server really, really quickly, and, uh, which was amazing. And we, we were really shocked by it because we didn't think it was going to be that popular. And then, um, and then we, you know, we had to get more server space, and eventually um, uh, YouTube came out. And we put it on YouTube. Actually, somebody else put it on YouTube before us. So there's another link out there, I think, w- you know, with Spin. And then we put our link on. But wh- what was so interesting about Spin was that it, um, it doesn't have dialogue, as you mentioned, so it could play internationally. And right. so if you look, actually, if you do a YouTube search, there's a Russian version. <laughs> Somebody in Russia posted it, which has like, I think 15 million hits. Um, so it's really, really popular in like Russia and other places. Um, but just because it doesn't have dialogue and it's sort of universal, but a- after spin came out, um, yeah, we, we got some, we didn't get a ton of like Hollywood attention. I guess we got a lot of attention from advertisers, people, you know, wanting to hire us to do commercial work and that sort of thing. Um, and we did send it to some various like Hollywood people, but that didn't, that didn't like blow open the doors for us necessarily. It definitely got us a fan base. And I'd say that was the, the, the most useful thing we got. We got a lot of people signing up on our mailing list. And then that in turn helped us when we um, released Inc. We had a much, much bigger fan base for Inc., which then that is – Inc. was the film that really kind of got us more hollywood attention. So after Inc. came out, then we started doing – you know, all of our general meetings, you know, we got our big Hollywood agent and started doing general meetings with the studios and all of that. Well, I, I guess you kind of just answered my next question. I mean, Inc. and The Frame, they had to have got you attention from some big names. Yeah, so with Inc., um, yeah, see, what, what happened? So with Inc., we premiered it at Santa Barbara Film Festival, International Film Festival, and out of that festival, we got a really good review from Ain't It Cool News, and then that got us and then the trailer was getting around and so that got us a lot of attention from the agencies and so we got a call from you know William Morris Endeavor and UTA and um I think ICM at the time and we weren't really I wasn't really looking for an agent um because I knew I didn't really want to be directing other stuff I didn't want to be a oh, director so, so WME has already contacted you they already wanted to uh... they, they, yeah they did back then okay um so, so they, they just they just signed uh, Jennifer Kent earlier this year did you see the Babadook 
I know I haven't seen it yet. Okay. I, I haven't honestly seen hardly anything in three months because all we've been doing is showing our own film. So I'm really, I'm like, I'm desperate to watch movies. It's like Have you seen longest. The Frame? That's a good one. You should check that one out. <laughs> thanks, thanks. No, I, I heard it sucks. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt you. So go, go ahead. No, no. Um, so, so in 2009, 2010-ish, we, um, we started doing meetings. Now, when we talked to UTA, you know, and I told him, I said, yeah, I, I really don't think I need an agent because I'm really just planning on doing my own thing. And they said, no, we can, we realize that we can help you kind of secure financing for your next film, even if you want to do it yourself and you want to do it independently. We, we still have those contacts. So I ended up signing with UTA and then they put me out on a lot of general meetings to um, Sony, actually. Sony was one of them, um, you know, and, and a lot of, you know, the big um, studios. And, you know, during that time, I, I was really kind of wrestling with because I was talking to them and a lot of other people and just trying to figure out, you know, is there any way to keep Final Cut and actually get a budget? And I think over the course of, you know, six months to a year of doing meetings and, and talking to different people, I think I realized, like, no, I, I, I should just keep doing what I've been doing. Um, and so the same thing has sort of happened with the frame again, you know, you know, with the frame coming out, I think, you know, we get we get those kind of calls, but I think this time we sort of ignored them, um, just because we're just, we, we know, we know where that's going to lead. And, and ultimately, uh, you know, UTA and, and any of these agencies, they're mainly focused on getting directors attached to, um, properties. So things that already have an audience, you know, books that are being developed into movies or movies that are getting developed into sequels or, um, remakes or whatever. And so that's really what they're looking to do either that or sell, sell scripts but even even scripts aren't selling i think like they used to not original scripts um again they're just looking for merchandise opportunities you know marvel um harry potter that kind of stuff so you wouldn't do i I don't know what the contracts are like with with these agencies but let's say they wanted you to let's say uh, game of thrones becomes a a movie at the end right Mm -hmm. you're saying that you wouldn't direct (laughs) it one time and just just so you could get the money to finance your next movie (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's always the uh, the question people ask, and and it's definitely yeah that that mentality of sort of one for them and and one for me, and um and there's a few, a few directors I think that have done that successfully, um, but no, I, for me my attitude is life is just too short, and it takes no matter what the movie it takes you know two to three years of your life to make it, and and a lot of your soul to make it, mm. no matter what it is, and um you know I've done. A, a fair amount of client work, like commercial work, and um, and know kind of what a concession that is. And I don't want to spend two or three years of my life doing something that's not mine, um, even if it's, um, you know, even if it's something good. I it's just not it's just not what, you know. I don't know if I'm going to die tomorrow, so I want to make sure I yeah. spend every hour doing what I want to do. All right, I got you. Your time's too important to you. I I I can I completely get that. Um, but my question. It, seem, it seems in terms of um, your films, they fit kind of that rubber reality genre, which is, a, as Brendan put it, sort of a, a genre that maybe encompasses films like Jacob's Ladder, Donnie mm-hmm. Darko, uh, Stay, uh, Mothman Prophecies, movies like that. And you I know no like director ever wants movies. to pigeonhole themselves. But is this like, let's say, the director you want to – is this like the direction you'd want to take maybe in future endeavors? Yeah. I mean I think um, – yeah, all those movies, it's so funny. Those are all, I would say – pretty strong influences. I mean, I saw Jacob's Ladder when I was, you know, pretty young and that, that was a huge influence on me. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's a huge compliment. Thank you. Um, and I think, I think the reason I, I don't think I ever planned on just like just doing sci-fi fantasy. Um, I think that the reason that I've, I've gone in that direction is I think that I, I personally have a lot of deeper questions about the world, you know, and, and I have a lot of deeper spiritual questions. And I think that sci-fi is a very um, easy way to explore those questions. So I don't know that I'll always kind of stay in that genre, but I think that, um, you know, I, I think in some way, I mean, I think when people think sci-fi, they have a very specific type of sci-fi. They're not thinking of Jacob's Ladder and Donnie Darko. They're thinking of Star Trek and Star Wars, you know? Mm-hmm. And so sci- the sci-fi genre is sort of a, an inaccurate um, label, I think, in a lot of ways, but it's the closest thing I think that we have. Um, but I think just going forward, I think it's just, f- for me, it's just going to be exploring um, kind of the deeper th- deeper ideas in life and, and um, 
you know, as I tackle each thing, it'll it'll probably be there will probably be some sort of you know quote unquote sci sci fi element to it. So no Jennifer Aniston rom com. No, <laughs> not yet. I don't know. No, or no. Catherine Heigl. Well, <laughs> uh, when I get a little bit older and I'm getting to turn into a softy, maybe that'll uh, maybe that'll, uh, that'll happen. Well, I mean, y- your movies do do a wonderful job, like exploring the age old question of deter- determinism versus free will. Uh, Brendan mentioned that earlier. Thanks. With everyone from philosophers to neuroscientists, you know, like John Searle, Sam Harris, uh, Michael uh, Gaza- Gazaniga, um, with them weighing in at different at varying ends of the spectrum, what are your personal opinions in terms of that age old question? Uh, yeah, free will and yeah. Just go ahead and answer it for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is it? Um, yeah, just a yes or no answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I. You know, I, I guess that I, I would say I have a very atheistic viewpoint of the world. I think that, um, you know, my, my attitude is that, um, and I spent a, a good deal of my, my life thinking about, even as a kid, this, you know, you can t- I can tell you how serious of a kid I was is all I thought about as a kid, <laughs> trying wow. to figure out the world. And, um, and I guess I have a very theistic standpoint in that, um, and I don't like to talk too, too much in detail about this because I don't want it to reflect um, – you know, how people see the films because I want them to be interpreted in their own way. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that there is, there is a, a purpose, you know, I do believe that there is, um, something behind it all. I do think that, um, I, I like to believe that there is, um, uh, a force or a, a God behind it. And I think that's, that's very much, you know, what, what the frame is about is the question of, is there, um, is there a God? And if so, then why do hor- horrific things happen? You know, is, is God malevolent? Does God just simply not care? Or is this all part of a bigger plan? And I think, um, um, yeah, but I guess my, my, my personal opinion is I think there's a purpose. Now, you used the word predestination, which is a very um, Christian theological term. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, there's, I, there's strains of... Uh, Christianity, known as Armenianism and Calvinism, which deal exactly with that free will versus predestination. Mm-hmm. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to, because I know you don't want to talk about it too much. Uh, were you raised by born again Christians? Um, I, I won't talk too much about that or, or a kind of religious, you know, religious questions. But um, but yeah, I, I would say that that's um, when I was a teenager. I think that was really where I first started hearing those. Um, terms, you know, when I was, I was doing a lot of different reading, um, about get different viewpoints of, you know, free will and predestination. So that's, you know, and so that's where that term comes from. Um, it's just, that's the term I adopted. And so I now think of it that way. I don't, I don't use another term, but, right. um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to get into it. Yeah, no, I, I, I get you. I, I, and I, and I, I completely understand why. So. Cool. Okay, cool. cool. Uh, um, might I also just ask one more other, uh, semi-personal question, but I think it's one you sure. can answer. Can you just sort of talk about the etymology of your name? It's an interesting, Jamin, right? Yeah, um, that's a good question. My mom thought she made it up. Um, it's a, but she, she just, she just took, I think, um, just took Ben off of Benjamin. Oh, and, okay. And thought, um, she, you know, she just made up a name. Um, but then, uh, uh, what happened? Oh, I think you know, years later, somebody told her it was actually a Hebrew name, and it was actually in the Old Testament. And um, so, yeah. But I, other than that, I, re- I really don't know. And your lovely wife, um, Kyo, is Kiowa, right? Kiowa, yeah, very good. So, did you guys meet at like a unique, n- unique name I know, it's or something? Or <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was like it was, it was, it was predestined that we were to, to be together. I think. Um, yeah, no, it's it's just so funny that we ended up. I actually, uh, Kyo and I went to high school together. And uh, no, we we haven't been together since high school. We just knew each other in high school. We were good friends, and then after we graduated, we lost touch for seven years, I think, and um, then got got in touch again. And we're friends for a while and started dating, and now we're married. And now now I've roped her into being my producer. <laughs> <laughs> now we we uh, Dan and I we watched the films on your list. Well, Dan, I don't know if you watched the uh, Double Life of Veronique. I couldn't find I couldn't find one with subtitles on it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But uh, they, they all seem to be, uh, except for the Blues Brothers, I mean, which you, you, which you, you had mentioned on that list of your, t- of your top ten weird films, which is not really a, a weird film. But uh, all of them do seem to uh, fit that, that sort of rubber reality, even, even Sympathy for Lady Vengeance with its, with its very weird editing. Um, mm. 
I love that term, rubber reality. I don't. Uh, I don't know if I made that. Dan thinks I coined he, it. I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah, you made it up. I don't. Th- we're, we're trademarking that stuff. No, I love that. I, I'm going to start using that. I don't know if I don't. I, I. You know what? I'm almost positive I didn't make that up, but it, <laughs> I, I could have though. You know. All right. Uh, we'll we'll credit to you, credit you anyhow. But um, when you know what? Now you guys just both got me off track there. Uh, <laughs> you were speaking to the his list, his top ten weird films list. Yeah. Where was I going with that? Uh, I, I completely forgot where I was going with that. I think I was going to mention something about um, In the Mouth of Madness. Hmm. In the Mouth of... Oh, oh. Um, are you an H.P. Lovecraft uh, fan? You know, I'm not. I, um, a p- few people have asked me that. I mean, I, I'm not, not a fan. I, I haven't really... Um, I don't know his stuff that well. Um, you know, I'll, I'm not really a huge horror guy. Um, I have a lot of friends that are, and so consequently I've watched my share of horror films, but... Um, and so I know the world fairly well. I know all of Carpenter's films and all the big, the big guys for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I just really loved In the Mouth of Madness, um, mainly because just the, the writing of it, I just thought it was really clever. Now I love all the monster stuff in it as well. Um, but it's, it's funny because the movie, it was written by a young Michael DeLuca, who's now a gigantic producer. Um, and uh, it's a really, in my opinion, it's a really brilliant script. Um, but he's never really been known as a writer and, um, he's just kind of this like hotshot producer who's just produced huge, huge movies. Um, but yeah, it's funny cause I didn't even realize it was him who wrote it until a couple of years ago. I looked back and I was like, who, who wrote that? Cause yeah, I, you, thought, you reason, thought it was, you thought it was John Carpenter. I assumed. Yeah. Cause I know um, Carpenter has written a lot of his movies. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it is kind of a, out of that list, it's, it's a little bit of its own thing. But if you look at it again, it's sort of, it is that rubber reality as, as you put it, um, so, well, yeah. I, th- I think Dan has a movie pitch. Well, let me just ask you this: Will you will you continue working with uh, with Chris Kelly? Because it seems like he, is he like your muse <laughs> in the same way, let's say Tim Burton and Johnny Depp or yeah. Woody Allen and Diane Keaton? Is this because I see the the pairing quite often? Yeah, it's um, it's funny. Uh, Chris and I have known each other for a long time. So he was in a um, uh, short film that I made. Is that um, Uncle Jack? Uh, no, that was, well, that one too, but he, he was in a short film I made called Blanston when I was like 22, 23 years old. And so I actually met Chris in an audition. Um, and, uh, and that was the first time I met him. I thought he was a really brilliant actor and, um, and just really love working with him. Yeah. Somebody asked me, do I, do I just have him on retainer? Cause he's just in everything that we do. <laughs> but I think, you know, when you really like working f- with somebody then you start writing them parts just cause you just want to keep on working with them. Um, so yeah, I have no doubt. I mean, I'm sure we'll, we'll keep on working together. Chris himself is a writer and director as well and, and a really talented one. So, I mean, over the years of me working on scripts and stuff, he's always been someone who I've, you know, sent you know, drafts of scripts to, to get his feedback. Didn't um, he do a Guinness documentary or something? Was that uh, him no, that did, probably did something in Ireland? There's, there's a few Chris Kellys out there. So, um, he goes by Christopher Soren Kelly on IMDb. So, Gotcha. Um, but, uh, but anyhow, he, uh, but yeah, he's, he's a great friend and just a really good collaborator as well. All right. Before, before Dan gives you his, his ridiculous movie pitch. Uh, <laughs> you uh, knew it was coming, Jamin. Is, I, is, yeah. is it Star Wars? <laughs> no, 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 but I, I do, I do, <laughs> a, I do have one more. Wait, s- you've already made that movie? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I do have uh, well, I do have one more serious question for you because you're also a composer mm-hmm. and your thoughts of pairing music w- with a visual medium uh, like like John Carpenter's Halloween. I mean, I'm sure you know the story that he he screened that for a bunch of studio execs without music. That, that right. And they they all went. This movie's horrible. <laughs> yeah, right. You know. And then he went, and, and, he, and then he said to himself, I I, I got to do something. I guess I'll put music in it. And, and then he you know then did 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 you know. And then he came back <laughs> and then and they're like, wow, this is the scariest movie I've ever seen. What is your what are your thoughts on how music can either make or break a movie? Yeah, you know, for me, that was always a huge thing. I mean, I think there's some filmmakers out there that have the the frame of mind that um, that music is a man- manipulation and they don't like to use music very much, if at all, because they feel like it's not real. Um, but I, I just see it again. I, th- I, th- I think of filmmaking as, of a, as a it's an art form of its in and of itself, and so you have all of these things to to work with you know like montage you know editing sound music and i'm a huge fan of using all the elements if i can and so yeah as as a kid i i you know i grew up um playing piano and um 
And so I had this like little crappy synthesizer that I always, you know, you know, play music on. And I guess I never really, I always wanted to, um, mix the two. I always wanted to mix, mix kind of the two passions of making movies and, and music, but I never thought I would be the composer. I always figured I'd hire like a real composer cause I didn't really think I was any good. And so that's what I did for, for the first few years of making movies. But then, um, it really, Kiowa was the one who really pushed me to, um, start doing it myself because I worked with a number of composers that were all great, but I wasn't able to go back and forth between the edit and the music as easily as I wanted to. Um, cause it's just a lot of work to ask somebody else to constantly be making changes because of the way I'm cutting something or whatever. Um, so, so I started doing it myself. Um, but but to get back to the point of your your question, yeah, I mean, I think for me, music is a huge part of the films that we're making, and they would definitely be different films without that. But a lot of my favorite films are really driven by music. Like one of my my favorite movies is Braveheart, and I mean, I like the soundtrack almost as much as the movie, just because it's so powerful. And I think the music, without the music, I don't know that it would be the movie it was. I mean, it's really it's a great movie and brilliantly directed, but the music just takes it to another level. I think. Right, and and uh, I'm sure you'll agree that the last ten minutes of the like the last of the Mohicans. Yeah, yeah, another Michael Mann film. Right. Um, Espe- yeah, especially where she's a, where, especially where Alice is about to throw herself off the uh, off the cliff. Right. Yeah, and, and that, the way the way that music slows down, I mean, like you, it really draws you into that situation and to, into her frame of mind. Exactly, and, and it's funny because we we have that we have that soundtrack and listen to it often. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Well, when scoring a movie, let me just ask you real briefly: Is it something where do you look to other people for inspiration in terms of not just let's say musicians, but other people that do that sort of work? In other words, are you looking to let's say Thomas Newman or Danny Elfman mm-hmm. for ideas in terms of how to integrate the music with the movie? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's no question. I I get a lot from from other composers. I mean, I think that's I'm not. This is, and I say this all the time, and and people kind of poo poo this comment, but I'm not a very good composer, really. Um, I I know just enough to to make music work for my movies, but um, yeah, we'll agree. You know, that's, oh, but but anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, actually, we really. In fact, you actually garnered high praise when it came to the gray right they used um the city surf in in for the gray right they did yeah um yeah that was an interesting story um i was actually uh i I was actually in the office that i'm in right now um and uh the the receptionist said hey joe carnahan's on the phone (laughs) and uh i was like you mean like the filmmaker joe carnahan and uh and uh I picked up the phone and sure enough, it was Joe Carnahan, which is, who's a huge hero of mine. I mean, I, um, I mean, blood, blood, guts, bullets and octane and narc were like huge influences on me, um, early on. And, um, and then, you know, later, um, some of the soundtracks in his movies were, were influences on me. So it was really cool to, and he was a really nice guy and, and, um, and the gray, I think is a great movie. And so we, I was really proud to have it in there. Um, but, uh, but anyhow, um, sorry, where was I going? Uh, I lost my train of you thought. Know, you, you were talking City about surf. Yeah, but you were also talking about how you draw influences from other composers. Oh, right, right. Um, yeah, so you know, I just grew up listening to a lot of composers. Um, yeah, I mean, the two names, I mean, Thomas Newman and Danny Elfman, were, were, of course, huge. I mean, if you're into film composition, those guys are huge. Um, you know, but I also just love, like, you know, Trent Reznor um, of Nine Inch Nails. Oh, did you um, see Gone Girl? Uh, no, I because again, he did he did the seen, he, no, he did the score for my, it. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard great things. I mean, I loved um, uh, Social Network his, his composition for that. Um, him and Atticus, Atticus Ross. Um, but yeah, they uh, so all these guys have kind of been influences. Um, so I don't I don't I wouldn't say that I I like I don't use temp music when I cut. I mean, I don't plug in somebody else's music and then try to create something that sounds like that. But um, but I will say that they, there's no question that, like, James Horner, for instance, you know, you can hear his influence in anything that I do. Um, Clint Mansell, um, there's another one, Philip Glass, uh, John Murphy, um, Moby. <laughs> um, so there's, there's a ton of influences for sure. Well, you know, you're in luck because uh, I'm sure you get this a lot, but me and Brendan were essentially. We're basically we're screenwriters, and you could say we're sort of <laughs> let's say like Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. I'm sure you o- are. Only we're you know slightly less retarded and and, and definitely much poorer. 
<laughs> I'm sure. I think we all are. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the truth. So we have a couple of pitches, if, you, if you'd mind just hearing them out. It'll just take a second. You just give us a quick yes, no, and don't worry. Our feelings won't be hurt. We know they're gold. So if you don't take them, you know, we've got someone else that's, you know, right on the horn with us. Okay, okay, hit me. All right, you ready? Now close your eyes, because this is going to be important. Okay. Now see if you can, you know, I want to set the mood. Okay. Got a rich girl. She no. falls in love with a boy from the wrong side of the tracks. But there's a twist. There's a twist. Her father doesn't approve. So will the old traditions drive them apart, or will their love find a way to conquer? It's, it's called Breathe Out. Not to be confused with Waiting to Exhale, but I think it's going to be the next big teen romance of the summer. What do you think? I think you've got a blockbuster on your hands for sure. I think, uh, I think it's a $100 million opening weekend. Un- unquestionable. Absolutely. All right. Well, what about this one? The year. 2005. Only it's the 2005 that was promised to us in the 1980s. You know, flying cars, laser guns, <laughs> shit sure. like that. <laughs> right. Okay. Our protagonist, a mild-mannered podcast host by day, <laughs> solves crime as a po- costume vigilante at night. He's known as the Power Walker. Gets up in a jumpsuit, got the dumbbells the whole nine. <laughs> okay. We're going to call it the cliche. <laughs> have every possible action movie cliche out there, right down to the the hand to hand combat at the end, uh-huh. all that stuff. Uh huh. Is it well? Is I, I, I only question the plausibility of this podcaster being really good at hand to hand combat. That's the, it's the only thing I throw out there. It's got a point. <laughs> My goodness. And let, how about this? A sequel to the Notebook. It's called The Legal Pad. It deals uh-huh. with their impending divorce. <laughs> Nothing? Uh, no? Hmm. Uh, All right. I, well, I, one I, other I like one. Now, we don't really have the, the plot. You can maybe help with this, but we've got the cast. It's called, I'm sure you're familiar with Sly Stallone's The Expendables, right? Uh, very, very, yeah. Okay, well, we've got one called The Unstables. <laughs> and we've, got, we've already got the cast, and I've spoken to these actors personally. They're on board. All right, we've got Mickey Rourke. <laughs> sure. Young. Uh, yeah. Nicholas Cage, for sure. We've got, uh, uh, who else do we have? We've we got, got we Charlie got, Sheen. Margot Kidder. <laughs> Margot Kidder, can't forget. And, of course, our newest entry, Shia LaBeouf. Shia LaBeouf, right. Can't forget him. And we've got Wesley Snipes, Lawrence Tierney. Mel Gibson is going to be one of our stars for certain. Well, I think you're basically just listening to the cast of The Expendables, I think. <laughs> well, well, except it's a slightly different. It's the uh-huh. Yes, because Stables. instead of them being some sort of um, elite army unit, uh-huh. they are going to be escaped mental patients. <laughs> you think there's some? I, I mean, each one of those actors can play that role to a T. I, I, you know, I would, I would, I have to say, I would be really careful putting this on the air because this very well could get ripped off. I would get this, I would get this into the, uh, the copyright. <laughs> oh, good. I thought you were going to say. Yeah, no, I thought he was going in a different direction. Say, I don't think Shia LaBeouf's <laughs> coming on our way, airways anytime soon. But you know, I appreciate you thinking we're that big. <laughs> oh, good, good. Well, no, I have no question. Um, I personally, I would go with a legal pad concept because I think it's, that's a really winning title. Sure. Um, I, I can't imagine anybody churning away from that um, right. at the box office. So, I, hey, well, it's either yeah. going to be that or the Howard the Duck reboot. <laughs> Perfect. Got one of those. You know, actually, I actually think that would get some attention. Well, the, uh, just, they did. They did have Howard the Duck at the end scene of uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. That's right. Is that right? Yeah. If you if you watch if you watch the after credit scene, uh, oh, you you, oh, see, you see an animated Howard the Duck drinking a glass of vodka. No kidding, man. I was the fool who, who walked away from the credits after that. Oh, don't you know by now? I know, I know. I know. It's the Marvel, Marvel calling card. You've got to stay to I the mean, end. Well, we saw it at a drive-in theater, and I think we were anxious to get what? out. What? Those are still around? Those? I know, exactly. Well, you had, we had to drive a good hour and a half to get there. but Did you get lucky? <laughs> that's that's, uh, that's I mean, between wow. me and... and uh, <laughs> Very okay. cool. All right. Well, we, you know what? We thank you for coming on, jo- uh, Jamie. Is it Jamin or Jamin? I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's just pronounced Jamin. Jamin. Okay. Yeah. We thank mm-hmm. you for coming on. And uh, anything else that you want to promote here quickly? Um, no. I just say if anybody is interested in seeing The Frame or Ink, just go to doubleedgefilms.com. And um, that's where you'll find it. And uh, it's also on iTunes and Amazon. And um, we're also on Facebook. If you just look up The Frame on Facebook, you'll find us. Okay. Uh, it's a fantastic well, well, movie. Very good. Yeah, very oh, good movie. But one other thing we forgot to ask you. Do you have anything else in the pipeline right now? I, I do. I do. Um, it's not going to be for a little while before uh, we're in production. But, yeah, we have something. I, I, I say that if you thought The Frame – was really crazy. Then this is this one's going to be really, really crazy. Right. So we look but, forward to that. But, but not. Uh, but but no spoilers yet. 
Okay. Okay. Well, when you get when it comes out, please come back on and uh, promote. We'd love to talk to you again. Uh, we, I'd love to, guys. This is this is a real pleasure. All right. Thank Thanks you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank, Take care. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye bye.